Hello, I'm Tamara Harms. I'm at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and my primary LTR affiliation is with the Bonanza Creek Program in the Boreal Forest of Interior Alaska. I was tasked with synthesizing the LTR network's contributions to understanding ecological connectivity. And I want to acknowledge that my thinking about connectivity has been stimulated and spurred on by interactions with Stuart Fisher and Will Wolheim, and that ideas in this talk have been stimulated by a paper by Laura Turnbull and colleagues that takes a very interdisciplinary perspective to understanding connectivity in the journal Advanced Network Science, and I recommend it. Connectivity is defined here as material or information movement between spatially and or temporally distinct entities. And any landscape or seascape is replete with examples of connectivity. So this Arctic tundra ecosystem is characterized by connectivity between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems via material and organismal transport that occurs in flowing water down hill slopes to streams and lakes. Stream networks then connect catchments to coasts via material flux and provide corridors for organismal dispersal. Humans are great at transporting materials and organisms over long distances, either intentionally or unintentionally, as in transport of invasive species via roads. And ecosystems are also connected in time. In this ecosystem, it is currently receiving less deposition from a neighboring glacial river basin, but there have been times in which lust deposition has been much greater, and that accumulation of lust supports many of the ecosystem processes occurring in this ecosystem today. Some forms of connectivity feed back to influence local processes. This is an example of long-range transport of carbon via the oil pipeline, which is then combusted to carbon dioxide at very distant locations, and of course, increasing carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are causing rapid warming of Arctic ecosystems that change myriad ecological processes, but are allowing increased release of carbon from previously frozen permafrost soils. So in this talk, I take the view that we are in need of a theory of ecological connectivity that much of our research on connectivity has been phenomenological. That is studying a particular form of connectivity where it is apparent or easy to measure. Within particular research foci like metapopulations, there are more advanced notions of connectivity, but that we need a broad theory that can encompass multiple ecological processes and multiple ecosystem types. And so I will make the case for several points that we need to address toward building a connectivity-driven research agenda and provide examples of studies from the LTR network that have advanced some of these notions, and then end by summarizing some opportunities to move this connectivity framework forward. So in my view, a connectivity research agenda needs to address several key points. The first is working out when and where the attributes of patches versus flow paths are most influential in the outcome of the connectivity. The second is to identify emergent properties arising from connectivity. Third, to study transformations occurring simultaneously with transport, and I'll provide examples of LTR studies that have addressed each of these. And then finally, resolving the relative roles and feedbacks among structural and functional connectivity, and finally, resolving issues of scale. So what I mean by patch versus flow paths effects are that the attributes of patches and the attributes of flow paths both influence the results of connectivity for ecological processes. And patch attributes may be things like whether a patch is a source or a sink, patch sizes, their permeability, their spatial arrangements. And flow path effects are things like the magnitude of flow paths, their timing, the structure of flow networks, and vector type. In this talk, I'll highlight examples that addressed wind and water vectors, but there are also other things that move materials or organisms around landscapes like um, mobile organisms or gas exchange. So the first example is a study that considers the roles of patches and flow paths in structuring microbial communities in the Arctic. And this study was led by Byron Crump. 
They studied a flow path from soil water to streams to lakes and found that bacterial species richness declined moving down slope along that flow path. They also studied the identities of those bacterial species, and this Venn diagram summarizes those results, showing the number of species discovered in each of the positions along that flow path, as, whether, as well as the number of species in common among those patches. And they find that the dominant taxa that are present in lakes were also found in soil water, such that putting these results together, we can see that there is connectivity in terms of bacterial composition along this flow path with soil water likely serving as the source of bacteria seeding these ecosystems and that the local receiving patches then select for those organisms that become dominant. In another example of the relative effects of patches and flow paths, Max Castorani and colleagues studied a 30-year time series of giant kelp occupancy, extinction, and colonization from the Santa Barbara Coastal LTR using remote sensing. And they compared apples to apples the relative effects of patch size and demographic connectivity. And they found that both connectivity and patch size increased occupancy of giant kelp and colonization and reduced extinction. So the left panel shows probability of colonization against connectivity on the x-axis, the right panel, the probability of extinction. And notice that the slopes of those lines vary, such that the effects of connectivity depended on patch size, with connectivity being more important to smaller patches than larger patches. And this study hints at the emergence of a property resulting from connectivity, that is the long-term persistence of kelp being promoted by increased connectivity. And we'll look next at a study that explicitly addresses that emergent property of resilience. And this is from the Mo'orea Coral Reef LTR, a study led by Sally Holbrook. They studied resilience of coral to a disease outbreak and a cyclone by monitoring coral cover over the long term and capturing these disturbance events in the late 2000s and then monitoring recovery of coral cover. And note that there's sp spatial variation in the degree of recovery of coral. Contrast the coral cover at present time in LTR1 compared to LTR3, which appears to, to not have recovered at all. And they find that the primary correlate of the degree of recovery is cumulative recruitment, where recruits of corals are drawn from connectivity with other islands via ocean currents and via shelf currents that move those recruits around the reefs of Mo'orea. So increasing resilience for reefs that are more strongly connected to sources of recruits. Now this isn't to suggest that connectivity always yields stability or resilience. Here's an example from desert ecosystems of the Hornada LTR that shows the opposite. So here, connectivity by wind and water promote a critical transition from grassland to shrub dominance in desert ecosystems. And this is because the interplant spaces of shrublands are much larger, and therefore the transport distances are longer in shrublands than in grasslands where more continuous vegetation cover shortens the distances over which seeds, water, and nutrients might be exported. And so these researchers, led by Deb Peters, used an experimental approach to test that hypothesis. They modified connectivity by installing physical structures that they refer to as connectivity modifiers or con mods, and found that when they reduced connectivity experimentally, that soil and litter accumulated, as expected, and that in years following, they observed a lagged recruitment of grasses, suggesting an initiation of plant soil feedbacks that supported the return of grassland. And they carried these experiments out in a landscape dominated by wind transport, shown in the left panel, by water transport, shown in the middle panel, and on the right panel, by a landscape dominated by water transport, but where there was very little water transport occurring. And they find that, that grasses recruited where they modified connectivity in these landscapes characterized by active transport. The studies that I presented thus far mostly assumed that transport was conservative, 
That is, materials were transported from patch A to patch B with no change in between. And that certainly characterizes some transport networks. Our circulatory systems are doing that, moving nutrients and oxygen around our bodies. But some networks support active transport, like river networks. And stream ecologists have developed a qualitative and quantitative framework for addressing simultaneous material transport and transformation, wherein materials are being transported downstream while also being taken up and transformed. And an experiment including multiple LTR sites called the Lodic Intersite Nitrogen Experiment measured those relative rates of transport and transformation for nitrate. And they found that consistent with first principles, aerial uptake rate of nitrate increased with stream nitrate concentration, but that the proportion of nitrate that's removed from transport declines with increasing stream nitrate concentration. And this is what's shown in the panels, the top showing total uptake, the bottom denitrification, nitrate concentration is on the x-axis, and V sub F, or piston velocity, the efficiency of nitrate uptake is shown on the y-axis. So the efficiency of nitrate removal declines exponentially with increasing nitrate concentration. And this is important because if we assumed conservative transport via river networks and attempted to predict nitrate export from nitrate input in catchments, our conclusions would be erroneous. So finally, a couple of issues that have been less well studied are relationships and roles of structural and functional connectivity, where structural connectivity refers to potential connectivity, that is, the network that exists to support connectivity, and realized connectivity or functional connectivity is when there is a, a vector present to, to connect those networks. So as an example, desert fluvial networks are characterized by many rills and dry washes that provide structural connectivity, but that connectivity is not realized until there's enough precipitation input to the catchment to support flowing water and connect that network. And importantly, there are likely feedbacks between structural and functional connectivity, such that past events might influence future connectivity. So in this desert stream example, a large flow event that modifies the location or nodes in the transport network might then sub subsequently influence future connectivity events. And then finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the effects of scale. Most of the studies that I, that I addressed uh, studied a particular spatial or temporal scale, but in reality, connectivity is occurring both within ecosystems and between ecosystems at various temporal scales, and our perception of those scales might, might influence our view of connectivity in ecosystems. And I think that these two figures do a good job of summarizing that. The figure on the left shows that perhaps nutrient spiraling or material spiraling is occurring in both streams and in soils, but that the transport distances in soils are so much shorter such that we, we don't typically observe them. The figure in the right is a Stommel diagram showing spatial and temporal scales of what's labeled oceanic events here, but many of these events are in fact forms of connectivity. So it's a reminder that any process may be influenced by local small scale connectivity like plankton migration and long range connectivity between ocean basins and resolving when and where those forms of connectivity our key, key to predicting ecological outcomes is a really open question. So finally, what can we do to realize a framework that, that adequately addresses ecological connectivity? Well, the first and most obvious is that we need to measure connectivity more often. In the literature, there are myriad metrics that measure various aspects of connectivity and may be useful for making comparisons both within and across ecosystems. I think it's really important that we generate frequency distributions of these metrics given the dynamics of connectivity in space and in time. And clearly it is easier to measure particular forms of connectivity or to measure connectivity in particular ecosystems. But we have surmounted challenges like this before. It was not initially easy to determine just how to measure net primary production in a way that was reflective of rates within an ecosystem as well as comparative across ecosystems, we can also surmount this challenge. Next, I think it's key that we address the consequences of connectivity for both upstream and downstream entities. All of the examples that I showed 
for the most part, addressed one or the other ends of that, that, that connection. And um, our view of the outcome of that connectivity may differ depending on uh, which end of that spectrum we're, we're comparing. So for example, the export of water and nutrients from those desert shrublands may be a boon to receiving desert streams and might stabilize productivity or other ecosystem processes in streams. Experiments might be a way to accelerate our understanding of the consequences of connectivity. And then finally, and most importantly, we have opportunities to engage in cross-fertilization of ideas and measures across ecosystems and disciplines. In my qualitative summary of the literature, connectivity has been best well studied in aquatic ecosystems and drylands. And so there's already opportunity to compare measures and outcomes in those ecosystems, and perhaps then to take ideas developed there and try to apply them in places where connectivity has been less well studied, like mesic terrestrial ecosystems. If you are interested in issues of connectivity, I welcome your questions and comments in the chat function of this talk. And please attend a discussion session for the LTR anniversary session, Wednesday, August 4th at 3 East.